Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be covering topic 2.1, which is Introduction to Biodiversity. Our objective for the day is to be able to explain the levels of biodiversity and their importance to ecosystems, and the skill that we'll be practicing at the end of today's video is describing environmental concepts and processes. So biodiversity is just the diversity of life in a given ecosystem, and we can measure on three different levels or scales. So the first and biggest level of biodiversity is ecosystem diversity. This is the number of different habitats that are available in a given area. So if we look at our diagram on the right here, we can see a bunch of different habitats. We have the ocean or potentially a large lake. We have a beach ecosystem, river ecosystem. We even have a little grassland leading up to the forest. Then we have a mountain ecosystem and even a desert on the backside of that mountain. So this is going to enable for a wide diversity of plant and animal species due to all of these different ecosystem conditions. So the next level of biodiversity is the species level of biodiversity. And so if we look at this diagram here, we can see all of the different species that are present in an area. And species diversity can be measured in two different ways that we'll talk about in more depth here in a second, but that's just the total number of different species in a given area, but also their evenness or how the individuals of the entire ecosystem are distributed throughout those populations. Then finally, we have genetic diversity. Genetic diversity refers to how different the genomes or the groups of genes are of different individuals in the population. So if we look at these three chipmunks here, they represent a population and we can see that each of them has a different genome. So they're going to have different genes. They might have different traits like different tail lengths, slightly different fur color. And so all of these factors can be considered biodiversity. And finally, it's really important to understand that the higher the biodiversity in general, the higher the health of the ecosystem or the more healthy the population is. So we'll talk about numerous reasons for this as we continue with today's video. As I mentioned, there's two different ways of measuring species diversity. That's richness and evenness, and we'll talk about those now. So species richness, which we denote with an R, is just the total number of different species found in a given ecosystem. Now, generally, the higher the species richness is, the healthier an ecosystem is. And that's because the more species that can be supported generally is an indicator of quality resources in that ecosystem, such as clean water or soil with a lot of nutrients. But it doesn't give us the entire picture. We also want to look at the species evenness. Evenness is a measure of how well all the individuals are distributed between the different species present. So evenness can help us understand, is there a balance between the population sizes of all of the different species, or are there a few dominant species in a given ecosystem? We have two communities here, community one and community two, and they're both going to have the same species richness, which is four. There are four different tree species present in each ecosystem. But if we wanna look a little deeper at species evenness, what we'll see is that community one has a higher species evenness, and that's because the organisms in community one are evenly distributed throughout the four species. So there are 25% of each of these four species making up the ecosystem. Whereas if we look at community two, it's dominated with 70% of the total organisms in the community belonging to one species. And so we would say that overall community one has a higher species diversity because it's more evenly balanced between the four species. So again, richness doesn't tell us the entire picture. As a rule of thumb, the higher the species richness, the healthier an ecosystem is, but evenness is an important measure to take into account as well. So now we'll talk about why genetic diversity is beneficial to populations. So genetic diversity is a measure of how different the genomes are of the individuals within a given population. Now I wanna point something out and that's that this is not an all or nothing attribute. So all populations have genetic diversity and it's there because there are random mutations that happen in the copying of the DNA in those organisms, but also because of recombination of chromosomes within the sex cells of the parents. Those two things give rise to new combinations of genes and also new traits altogether. And so all populations have some degree of genetic diversity. It's not like a population either does or doesn't have it. It's just that some populations have a higher degree of variability or more genetic diversity. The more genetic diversity a population has, the better it can respond to environmental stressors. So these could be things like drought or fire or famine. 
And that's because if there's more diversity in the genomes, there's a higher chance that some of the members of the population have traits that enable them to thrive in these new conditions brought about by the environmental change. So let's look at an example here with potatoes. A lot of times farmers plant one single species of potatoes that are actually all genetic clones of each other because it's really efficient for watering and applying fertilizer and harvesting. But what that means is that if there's a disease, in this example, a potato blight, the disease is going to wipe out every single member of that population and there will be no potatoes left. But if we look at the top half of this diagram, potatoes that have more genetic diversity, so even within the same species, there are potatoes that have a lot of genetic diversity. And when the blight hits, it's only going to wipe out a few of the individual plants in that species. And so because a lot of the plants have adaptations that allow them to survive the blight, because of that genetic diversity, we'll have a population of potatoes that survives the disease. And so again, this is just an example of how high genetic diversity within a population can protect it from environmental stressors such as disease. And we'll talk about something called a bottleneck. A bottleneck event is an environmental disturbance that kills a lot of the members of a population regardless of their genome. So it's not natural selection. It's just a large disturbance such as a fire or a hurricane. And it's going to kill members of this population regardless of their genome. So what happens is the surviving population is a lot smaller and it has a different genetic makeup or a different gene pool than the original population. So it no longer represents the diversity of the original population. Here's an image to help us understand why we call it a bottleneck. Imagine that we have this bottle filled with all of these organisms. And when we pour a few of them out through this narrow bottleneck, we're left with a population that no longer reflects the starting population. So we have no more of the yellow trait in the new population. And it's heavily dominated by blue as opposed to being more balanced before the bottleneck event. Big takeaway here to understand is that bottleneck events reduce genetic diversity. It also reduces the population size, so that's going to make the population more vulnerable to future environmental disturbances. Another problem that results when we have an especially small population size is inbreeding. So inbreeding is when organisms mate with close family members, and this is a bad thing for populations because it increases the chances of a deleterious or a harmful mutation, and that's because the genomes of the parents are so similar that they're more likely to pass on two copies of a harmful allele. So let's look at a diagram here to help us understand. When we have inbreeding going on down here between two members of the same litter, they both have the small a, the recessive copy of this allele that's harmful, that has a mutation that's going to reduce the fitness of this offspring. So because they both contain that recessive allele, they have a higher chance of passing on to their offspring. And so the offspring of inbred parents oftentimes have decreased fitness. So smaller populations, again, are more vulnerable to this because it's just harder to find a mate that's less closely related. So with these panthers, we have a great example of inbreeding depression in the Florida panther community. So in the 1900s, habitat loss and hunting from humans reduced their population size down to just 30 panthers. And so what that resulted in is a lot of inbreeding and it led to inbreeding depression, which means that the offspring suffered from some really harmful mutations such as kinked tails, heart defects, decreased sperm counts and undescended testicles in male panthers. So this makes it a lot harder for them to reproduce and the offspring they do have have a less likelihood of surviving and reproducing themselves. So this was really bad. It almost caused this species to go regionally extinct. But what happened is scientists actually brought in pumas from Texas to introduce some genetic diversity. Pumas are a subspecies of panther. And so when they bred with these pumas that had a diverse gene pool from Texas, it led to a recovery of the population and decreased this harmful inbreeding depression effect. Finally, we'll wrap up by talking about ecosystem resilience. So resilience is the ability of an ecosystem to return to its original condition after some sort of disturbance. So after a wildfire comes through and burns down most of the vegetation, or a hurricane comes through and uproots all of the plants and disturbs a lot of the soil, just like high genetic diversity helps populations recover, high species diversities helps ecosystems recover. And that's because if there are a wider diversity of plants present in a given area, 
there's a higher likelihood that they're going to quickly return. And when plants return, they anchor the soil. So they prevent soil erosion. They keep the valuable microbes and decomposers in the soil to help uh, recycle nutrients. They're also going to provide shelter and food for different animal species to return. So again, the more diverse the plant species in an area, the more quickly it can respond from a disturbance. Our practice FRQ for topic 2.1 today is going to cover the skill of describing an environmental concept or process. And I want you to describe one of the three levels of biodiversity and then explain how high biodiversity at that level you described is beneficial to ecosystems. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful. Subscribe for future Apes video updates and check out other notes over here to the side. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar.